Welcome to the Dividend Talk Podcast, episode 33. What are REITs and should you invest in them? Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Dividend Talk. I'm your co-host, Engineer My Freedom, and today I'm joined with European DGI. This is a podcast where we discuss our passion for dividend growth investing with our own unique European flavor. If you're new to this channel, please hit the like button and subscribe to us and check out our previous episodes on YouTube and Spotify. See you on the inside. Wow, what what a week we've had this week. There's just so much to talk about. I, I don't know where to start. But first of all, I should say we have a guest on today. We have Dividend Dane. Some of you might know him from Twitter. Welcome to the show, Dividend Dane. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. And, uh, thanks for having me on. Perfect. And as always, I'm joined with European DJI. How are you? I'm also fine. And thanks for having me on. We will... Uh, <laughs> we. <laughs> We will jump into the news in, in a few minutes, but before we do that, David and Dane, if you just want to briefly just tell people who you are and, and what you do a little bit. Yeah, well, as uh, the name suggests, I'm from Denmark. My name is Heino, and I um, I am also a dividend investor. I work in the insurance business um, in, my, in my 40s and uh, have been dividend investing for uh, three or four years now. Um, before that, it was a little more randomized what I what I bought. Awesome. So we're going to talk a little bit about real estate investment tr- trusts later. So looking forward to that. But before we get into any of that, let's talk about we have to we have to talk about GameStop. What have you made of this week with all all the craziness that's that's happened? Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's been interesting. That's for sure. Um, a lot of uh, surprising moves in some very surprising companies that i would normally <laughs> not invest in um yeah wisdom of the crowds and all that i mean it, it, it's crazy it's hard not to have fomo i mean look looking at the share price it's it's not it's it's too risky for me and, and i'm fully aware of the risk but when when you see a stock price like that go and on my blog there's a there's a there's a Reddit curator called Swaggy Stocks, and he reached out to me a few weeks ago asking to write a post on my blog, an old guest post, and I happily obliged. And he wrote about about the Reddit sentiment about this just before it, it started to pop. I mean, so I, I knew something was brewing, but I, I just kind of overlooked it. But looking back now, I wish I kind of just read a little bit more into it and, and put some money into it. What, what are your take on it, um, European DJ? I'm sure you have some thoughts. Well, you know, I, I, for me, it was just popcorn. I've been just watching every time. And then uh, Chamat came on uh, on CNBC also uh, saying like, well, it's payback time for the hedge funds. And I mean, uh, for me, it's just fun to see Game, game Shop, GameSpot, GameStop, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. I, I, it's for me just really fun to watch. And uh, um, I wish all those investors lots of profits and um, I saw a nice tweet the other day, like uh, also that Robin Hood uh, stopped stopped them uh, or forbid them to trade on it, and they said like, "Where's the <laughs> where's the officer of Nottingham Forest?" Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, it's it's nice. Um, uh, power to the people, right? Yeah, and I, I mean, what happened with some of the brokers was was crazy. I, I couldn't log on to Trading Two One Two, for example, um, on Thursday Thursday night or maybe Wednesday night. It was down for a couple of hours. Um, the Gairo was was perfect. I could log on to them. They they were fine, but I was seeing on Twitter they have these scanners for all the different brokers, and one after one, Swab, IB, all of them went down around the same time. So it's absolutely crazy what's going on. If if I was a holder, I, I would have to sell. I mean, how, this can't go up forever. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I I get I get the whole excitement, but there's it reminds me of Bitcoin. In December 2017, when it just popped, and people were getting on it too late, and they're the people that will be left 
carrying the can. And I was in work yesterday, and one of the guys, I mean, he's he's not into stocks, but he, he said he called me over and said, "Oh, you're into stocks. What what do you think is? I bought some some game." And I said, "Did you own a brokerage account before?" And he said, "No, I just opened it, just to place that trade." And my exact words was, "No offense, but when people like you are buying shares like this, it's time for me to sell." It's time yeah. for me to get out of the market because it, it's it's parallel to, to Bitcoin 2017. To so what I would love to do is, and I'm really considering that, to enter a post on Reddit, uh, put one to to make a case for General Electric. You know, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's at $11. I could use it at $200. It would cover my losses. So <laughs> if any one of the Reddit fans is listening to this, please write a case for General Electric. Help this poor guy out. Come on, please. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, look, look. Next week is going to be interesting to watch how this how this plays out. I I hope lots and lots of people make lots of money, and and hedge funds are not too concerned. It they'll make money over the long term anyway. Um, but just if you're listening, be 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 careful. It it can't go up, can't go up forever. But and anything else, anything else in the news caught your eye this week? No, actually, <laughs> just all the earnings for the rest of us just game shop for me. So yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's pretty much it. But actually, I, I did see a video from uh, Sven Carling on. He, uh, there was an interview with Jeremy Gatham, and you might remember a couple of episodes yes. ago. I mentioned, I mentioned, I, I read an article and I posted a link, and Sven actually went through this interview and and gave a pretty good case of how this market is overextended and there is a, a chance that it's going to going to plunge and plunge hard so I, I recommend watching it i mean it's a little bit depressing when you come off the back of of what we just talked about with, with gamestop but that kind of further i don't know reinstills in me that we are reaching a peak here we are reaching some sort of peak and, and i expect in a correction definitely watch the video and he links then to a further interview that jeremy did and i think they are worth watching it's worth grounding yourself and, and being aware of the potential risks. And on top of that, the IMF, the European IMF, the International Monetary Fund, they've now started to send out warnings. I mean, they're saying that these COVID rescue programs are going to tri risk triggering stock market crashes. So we're starting to see a lot of noise in and around this. And, and with the antics from, from last week, for me personally, I, I think it's only a matter of time. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm waiting for it. I've, I'm cash rich, rich. So let's uh, J and J uh, come down with forty percent, and I'm a happy buyer. I mean, that's how I look at it. Uh, yeah, really cool. Yeah. So we'll move on to our main topic. We're going to talk about real estate investment trusts. It, it's it's an area that I'm starting to look a little bit more into. Um, I've I've been DMing. David and Dane on the side, and he's, he's he gave me some companies to look at, and, and they've been great. So we might just start introducing it. So David and Dane, if you'd like to just briefly describe, in your opinion, what a REIT or a real estate investment trust is. Yeah, so a real investment trust is essentially, um, there are two types. I'm talking primarily about the U.S. because that is where the term comes from. There are two types. There are equity REITs, which is um, any type of company that owns building buildings or land that you can do commercial, uh, any type of commercial activity in. Um, they don't have to be a real estate investment trust, but they can be if they choose to. Um, that's one type. Um, then you have what is called an M read, and an M read is a company that uh, invests in mortgage-backed securities. So essentially, they buy mortgages that then people pay interest on. Um, that is not my speciality. I'm not wildly familiar with with uh, with mortgage-backed uh, securities in in the U.S. So I'm not going to get a lot into that. Um, but but. But the the equity re it's 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 um it's a it's a pretty big thing um the the largest company that is a, that does real estate in in us is not a read that's called blackstone blackstone owns 
real estate all over the, the world. And for some other reason, it's not a real. But, but uh, people would, in, in our community, would, would probably all know uh, the company with the ticker code O, the realty income, which is something a lot of people have and then might not be wildly familiar with what it is that they actually do. But that is a, that is a, that's a, an example of a read. But a read can, can essentially be anything, any type. There's a lot of different types of reads. So that is. The, and, and what is the um, benefit for dividend investors to own real estate investment trusts? Well, a real estate investment trust, uh, the reason for it is its existence is that it, the company themselves don't pay corporate taxes in the U.S. They so, but they are obliged to pay out their earnings in dividends. So you say they they pass on the taxation to the shareholders. So a lot of uh, dividend investors are interested in in REITs because these companies have to pay out dividends. If they don't pay out dividends, they can't be a REIT. So, to most to most people, that that is uh, so. It's very it's very attractive to dividend investors because of of the structure of of the company. And is it then easy for a real estate investment trust to also pay growing dividends? Well, that depends on on the business, and that is why. Uh, you can't just put it all reads into one basket because they are wildly different in their business model. What I mean, you could, I mean, I know of a, of a, of a, of a read that is as its main business, they own gas stations, you know, where, where you, you go and fuel your car and that might not be long-term something that'll grow wildly with the, with uh, electric vehicles coming, so they they might be, you know, twenty five years down the road, they might be dwindling. But then there are other, uh, if I mean, if you look at data centers, for instance, uh, the past ten years, it's just been explosive growth, and with uh, with with everything becoming increasingly digital, then the amount of data. That needs to be handled somewhere by someone uh, increases. Then there's an increasing need for for data centers. So, yeah, it depends on the business mm-hmm. whether or not it can. I've we, we're going to get back to that, but um, I've picked a, a few where you you can see uh, some pretty significant growth. Cool. You you, you mentioned that a read has to pay out a, a certain amount of its profits in, in dividend. So recently, a company called Tangor, ticker SKT, they've yes. cut they cut the dividend. So, yes. what happens in in that case to REITs? How how do they still be a REIT after after like they, they caught it suspended it for example? Yeah, because uh, it's it's like any other business essentially. If you're not making any money, you can't be paying out any money. And Tangor, um, they. The, the 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 real estate they own is very very retail oriented. It's not prime real estate, but it's they have a lot of these uh, malls and stuff, and uh, a lot of their their customers uh, were shut down. I mean, the, the the companies that then leased their their buildings they were shut down through COVID, so they can't pay their rent. So Tanger is not making money, and then they can't pay out any money. Do they have a time period before they lose that read status? Yes, I'm not entirely certain of uh, of of how long that is, but but there is a, a limit to to it. Yeah, yeah, because uh, yeah, I, I know they've reinstated the dividend now, but yes, at at the time I I bought them. I, I mentioned it was one of my biggest mistakes. I bought them, and we, we we get back to that. But I was wondering how. Like I knew REITs have to pay a certain amount of their, their profits, so how how could they actually suspend their dividend? And what happens to that company? And I, I know they they lose their real estate license or their REIT license. I just wasn't sure how long it might take. I, I'm, but, I'm not entirely certain. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'm yeah, not entirely yeah, sure. certain how long it is. And and in terms of REITs, is there any tax benefits compared to 
normal securities are, are stocks? Not not to the individual. Uh, so if you buy REIT, you, there's no benefits uh, to you because it's essentially viewed as a stock. Um, but there is to the company that they don't have to, to pay their corporate taxes that they would normally do. And is that the same throughout the US and Europe? Are, are already varying varying rules across the two different continents? There are very various uh, varying rules. Um, European countries tend to have, uh, depending on the country, of course, but they have more strict uh, taxation rules. But it's essentially the same. It's been more or less adapted. The the read uh, structure, if you will, um, that was in place in the U.S. has been more or less adopted with some modifications, and that varies uh, through each individual European country. It's not it's not uh, all European countries that have REITs. Um, I have a list of them here. It's Belgium have them, Bulgaria, Finland, France, Germany, Ireland and uh uk spain have them as well i didn't hear denmark, most, denmark no, on that Den list no denmark and uh sweden are not so for for uh, we, you talked about castellum right yeah and castellum is not a REIT. it's a real estate company but it's not a REIT. so so uh it, 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 it's a it's a significant difference because it also you could you could say from from the from the company's point of view, you can say they're not, their hands are not tied with regards to their earnings. I mean, if they have a, a, a magnificent year and everything, and they have a lot of cash on hand, maybe there are some interesting options for them to use. Uh, maybe they can buy another, you know, some, some more real estate somewhere at a very appealing price. Um, so they don't pay out in dividends. But if they were a REIT, they would have to pay out and then they would have to go uh, secure financing for whatever they they wanted to invest in. So, I mean, there are benefits and there are, there are pros and cons and everything. Yeah, that's, just, that's, that's, an, that's an interesting concept because I've came across that with Venovia in, in yeah. Germany recently, I mean, you, you view them as, as a read and, and that's what I thought they were. But then when, when you read and it was Phil who we had on a guest who pointed out to me that they're not an actual read in, in a read sense because they don't have to pay out a certain amount of their profits. In, in fact, they say on their annual reports, we, we aim to pay out up to 70 percent, but they're not they're not tied to that. They're, they're, they're certainly not tied. So it's, it's probably one of the key differences in, in Europe that it's probably more common for these kind of structured companies rather than than REIT. So it's it's just to be careful as a, as a European investor. Yeah, that is one of the within the REIT structure. There are some other differences. Um, the main difference is accounting wise. Um, we don't have the same standards in Europe that we do in in, in America. So. Um, if you read uh, uh, like a quarterly or annual report from, say, Realty Income, and you then you have a European read, uh, it'll be there will be differences that you have to be aware of when you're trying to 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 make sense of it. Um, in US, um, there is they use uh, a certain amount of depreciation, regardless of whether or not the, the value of the real estate depreciates. And, and then that depreciation is then added on later to the net income. So it's a there are some differences that you have to be aware of when you're when you're when you're looking at these reports. I, I noticed that when I was analyzing Castellum, because they don't talk about funds from operations, they talk about um, invest. No, I said uh, net profit from property management. Yeah. which is effectively kind of the same uh, but to your point uh, it's um, it's even called different for that reason and what I also liked was kind of a fun fact that you brought it up because they made a deal with Blackstone to sell 18 billion uh, for 18 billion of Sw Swedish crowns their uh, their assets uh, when the entra deal will uh, will go on I think 
it should be an announcement in a few days, right, uh, about the Entra deal in Norway. So fingers crossed, because it might make it really attractive there. But uh, they already uh, started selling five billion. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what uh, my question uh, that I had for you is like you obviously know a lot about real estate investment trusts. Uh, so I was wondering, where does the passion come from for 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 this sector? Well, for me, it's um, I actually came across um, this real estate management sort of by accident really i mean it was uh, i was i was doing something entirely else and uh and was looking to to uh, to to find something new and then an opening just came uh and then i found it really really interesting and i have a a very close friend that i've known since child since childhood who's done very very well for him himself and uh and he is invested in some real estate uh, all over Copenhagen. And um, so we've talked a lot about real estate and I helped him start the, the managing side of, of it uh, here. And so it's, it, it's become sort of a passion and interest, if you will. Um, and I'd like to probably work in, in, in that area again at some point. Yeah. And is, uh, do the dividends play a role there? Because generally, we know that real estate companies pay a little bit above average dividends compared to other uh, yeah. other sectors. Let's say. Um, yeah, yes, I mean it, it. It sort of it sort of makes sense to me. The whole dividend investing kind of or dividend growth investing kind of made sense to me when, once I really started um, taking an interest in that. I mean. To me, it, it makes sense that that I invest in something and then they, they, they pay up. I'm not a trader. I don't, mm -hmm. I'm not going to jump aboard the GameStop train and, and just cross my fingers. It might go to 3x and, and then I can go out. That's not at all for me. It's um, I want to see, I want to uh, look at a company and say, I, I believe in this. I can see a future in this. I understand what it is they do, and um, and I'm and I'm bored. And then they pay me a dividend, and then I can reinvest that dividend or invest it in something else. Or so so. And once I, I I got into the whole dividend thing, and the real estate was the kind of an interest of mine, and then uh, it it just came natural. To no more. Maybe last question around that: How much of your portfolio is approximately in real estate investment trust from a dividend portfolio point of view? Currently, it's probably around 30, 35 percent. Okay, cool. So probably high. <laughs> a little bit high for for my portfolio, but I can see the I can see the attraction. But but given given your experience in in the area. Do you see any opportunities at the moment for investing in in REITs, in, in sectors, or what are the catalysts, etc.? Yeah, well, the thing is with with REITs, and because the companies uh, with that REIT status are so different, there are a lot of um, you can ride a lot of major trends through real estate. I mean, if you think that the whole digitalization and data being growing and being needing to be managed if you if you think that's a trend you can buy a data center if you think that uh, e-commerce uh, is probably gonna be even bigger you can you can buy real estate that that dives into that because Amazon and whatever these companies are called they need distribution centers they are thriving quite a lot um the same thing you go with uh, the 5g rollout by uh you know the, the companies that own the towers right and, and and we can go on like uh one of the things that that is starting in america is um we've had it here because european small, countries are smaller like these food delivery uh like hello fresh and, and stuff like that um they, you need buildings that are designed to hold food. That means that the buildings need to be have uh, refrigeration and all those stuff. 
you can buy a company that has buildings uh, like that all across America. And, and we can go on and on and on um, if you want. Uh, you have in major metropolitan areas in the, in the US, apartments have become very expensive. So they become smaller. And then you have, don't have you don't have room for all your stuff. So people have been buying like these storage units all over, uh, and it's been a the several companies there. So you can you can kind of dip into different parts of of uh, real estate. Is not just real estate. I mean, if everything was just hotels or apartment buildings, it would be one thing. It's not. so you're really looking at secular growth trends um, in yeah. some of the um, sub industries. Yeah. Cool. That's a that's a nice way of looking at it. Have have you ever thought of the cannabis trend? I think yes. Uh, I, I, RP, Wolf, Wolf of Harco Street yes. brought it to my attention. That is it. I I R P. Yes, I I I I P R. P R. Sorry. Um, they are since they they got on the exchange in late sixteen, I think, and it's up eleven hundred and forty five percent since then. Wow. And they increased the dividends by seven hundred and twenty-six percent. So in that time, so yeah, you should have uh, gotten on board that train for sure. I, I I've, pro I've promised Wolf that I'll I'll look into them. I think it was uh, like six weeks ago, and I, I just haven't yet. But I'm starting to think that I should. It's a niche. It's a it's a it's not a huge company. I think it's around four and a half billion. So, but they. They um, they they have buildings designed for companies that that handle the the medicinal uh, yeah. cannabis. Yeah. So uh, popular. And that leads me then on to my next question: What is one of your favorite reads? Oh well, <laughs> I, I kind of included uh, IIPR in that <laughs> because of Wolf, <laughs> but. Um, I would say that uh, I like currently one of the, the companies I really like is called Prologis. Ticker is PLD. It's a industrial REIT. They, uh, they, that's the distribution centers uh, for Amazon, et cetera. Uh, it's a $78 billion uh, company. So it's quite large. And um, they've been growing that they grow their revenue about 20% every year and they keep reinvesting and, and, and growing. It's um, they're up around 165% over the last five years, uh, the stock price and the dividend is up around, uh, around 35, 40% in that time period. So that would be a company that I definitely uh, could see. And it's the biggest in that and, and biggest, is better. It's easier for them to go to the to the banks and, and finance uh, acquisitions. So, yeah. Are, are they US based? Yes, that's a uh, US based. Have you got any European reads on your list? Um, not one of my. I, I the not one of the ones that I kind of included in my. But I do know that another one I included on my list is called American Tower Corporation. They are called AMT. It's a telecommunications tower. I know they just require, acquired um, a lot of, of the, uh, the cell towers that uh, I think the Spanish company Telefonica um, owns um, in a quite big deal. Um, they, are, they are a global presence, and I think that they are definitely moving into your heart. It's a, that's a very attractive company as well so maybe a question to you emf which which real estate investment trust do you own i've got the monthly dividend paying company oh obviously realty income and i've recently bought vanovia as well um which as we established is not a read in the real sense of the world but it's, it's in that area so they're the only two that i have i do want i do want maybe one or two more to bring that sector up to about maybe eight or ten percent of my portfolio so i'm definitely going to look into some of the ones that wolf has said to me first of all and also dividend in yeah 
So maybe a fun fact, I'm, um, I'm having one of my larger positions, number six or seven is in Omega Healthcare Investors because it's effectively for old people in nursing homes. And uh, I felt like, well, America's getting old. All these people in Florida, they must, <laughs> they must find a spot to uh, spend their last days because that's really, really what it's about. And uh, it's been doing me quite well because it has always had a yield around 8%, quite safe, it, even, this, even though this, uh, the yield spiked to 15, 16% during uh, COVID-19, it popped up quite big again. Um, it's such a company I should have never had in my portfolio because I bought it because others recommended it. But, uh, you know, sometimes you just, uh, uh, you know, you win something without even uh, understanding why and you just keep it then, right? Definitely. I actually have a couple of, uh, I found a couple of Irish REITs that you might want to look into. Uh, there is one called Green. Green REIT. I'm aware of green. And then there's one called Hibernia. Yeah, Hi Hibernia and green, but I, I did own green. Um, they were one of the first. So when, when I started buying shares, I bought Glen B and I bought green um, at the time. But I think green have have gone now at the moment. So I, I know the guy who sold my shares for me without me asking and and gave me back. I actually made a profit on him, so I was, I was quite happy at the time. But yeah, I, I believe they are gone, but Hibernia are still, are still there. There's also I, called the Iris, I-E-I-R-E-S, I read. Okay, I never, I never heard of them. I'm, I'm, I'm always, see, Ireland is such a small place, so I, I feel like there's limited room for growth for, the, for these companies. I mean, Dublin is getting saturated. It's, it's, it's the main place. If you compare the size of Ireland to Manchester in the UK, for example, it's the same population, so... I prefer, that's why I yeah. prefer European yeah. or bigger, bigger countries that can expand a, li a little bit more. But no, they're, 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 good, they're good companies that, well, Hibernia is a good company. I'm not sure about Iris, but I'm, I'm staying away. I, I got born to a green, as I said, so I'm staying away from Irish for, for the moment. Is, is there any, any in Holland? Or the Netherlands? Uh, no. Yeah, well, maybe not officially called a real estate, but what about Euro, uh, Euro commercials? They own a lot of the shopping malls. The um, oh, um, always a very juicy dividend. And I think it's a Belgian company, Wereldhaven. You've got Unibil Robanco, Rodamco. Uh, um, yeah, their Belgium companies can be REITs. So they, I'm not wildly familiar, but I know that there are a few in uh in belgium but but holland is not does not have the read status at such so no not the read status but i know that euro commercials is yes. one of those unibill rodamco they, they are treated yeah. like yeah. such kind of companies with juicy yields yeah pretty pretty big uh, some of them have some what they've been a little exposed during this COVID, because if, i mean having a shopping center right now is not probably <laughs> yeah, I would stay away from Euro commercial for sure. And if you read their, I read uh, their annual reports of the last few years, and um, they had big plans also to go to, I think, half a year quarterly dividend. But then when COVID kicked in, they they withdraw withdrew all of that. So it's no, nah, I would not in, not recommend any one of my family to even consider Euro commercial as no. an example at this moment. I I do have one more question. And one one of the criticism that I find about dividend investing that that you see online or people often say to me is that we tend to get a little bit too heavy into REITs for for the income because because the dividend is so high, and it's it's a fair point. But is there any dangers for investing in in this area? Of course, but again, it's about uh, it it's about the the underlying business. Um, there have been some companies in this sector that have been just s smacked around uh, during this COVID because they essentially lost all their business. I mean, if you run hotels or uh, you have uh, movie theaters or, or gyms and they are shut down, I mean, you're not making any money. So, so some of them, but it, it, I kind of sometimes feel it's like second guessing. Who would ever have thought of COVID a year ago? 
I mean, or, or a year and a half ago. We, none of us could ever have guessed. And, and so this is like a black swan kind of event. I can't really, some of them, yeah, they, they might be in, uh, I, I would say some of the, the retail apocalypse, if you will, that, that people have sort of been predicting. Um, it, it is only somewhat true. Uh, it depends. Again, it's um, if you have a strip mall in some shitty area of, pardon my French, uh, of some town, it, it might not be, it might not be the greatest thing. But 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 you know, it, it's prime real estate will always do fine. I mean, go to any major metropolitan area, and there will be areas where it's just attractive to have a store or a restaurant or whatever it is you need. Yeah, I, I agree. So my last question to you, and it doesn't have to be read actually this time, but if you would maybe give one stock from Denmark, one company that you would consider for our community to. It maybe has to be an overlord, doesn't it? But yeah, of course. Just, uh, um, just not to, to be, uh, but it's a, it's a, it's a different kind of stock, but they, they're actually quite good on dividends. And it's a large cap stock. Uh, it's called Scandinavian Tobacco Group. And it's not um, tobacco in the sense like when if you buy Altria or something like that. It's not cigarettes. They produce cigars. And they produce like the top line of cigars, Cohiba. They own uh so it's like the premier brands of 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 uh, cigars globally, and it's a it's a niche, and they're very very uh, they're very um, investor friendly with that evidence. Let's put it that. So that might be a, an alternative to a low risk. I'm just waiting for the day that Lego goes public. I mean, I will be the first buyer, just as a sentiment buy. It'll never happen. No, unfortunately, not not in my lifetime. Yeah. Okay, so thank thank you, Dividend Dane. Uh, for, uh, really helpful, and I think it's also really interesting for uh, some of our followers that um, always wondered a little bit like, what is real estate investment trust? So if you have any question, also feel free to reach out to Dividend Dane. We'll put this link to, to his Twitter profile also in the description of the, the, the podcast notes on Anchor and on YouTube. So maybe it's uh, time to also look a little bit at two companies that we had in the uh, that reported their earnings this week, and maybe EMF, you would like to take the first one. I, of course, I'm going to talk about tea. I mean, by the dip, isn't it on under thirty? So we should be loading up on these. But uh, I, I had a I had a look at at, at their earnings, and I, I wasn't personally overly impressed. Okay, and I know they've beat expectations, but expectation weren't incredibly high the bar wasn't wasn't set wasn't set too high i'll start with the positives i mean there's the subscriber growth was high so they, they've it's up nearly six million i think the prepay group is up a lot as well so it's good the free cash flow is always solid so their pay ratio is around 50 percent um, and as i said they, they beat the estimates but i i i was struggling to understand so i was i was going through there going through that quarterly report and it has their their debt their net debt was 146 billion they have and i was trying to work these figures out and i could not match those figures up so i was writing to dividend wave who has been great this week because i hadn't had much time when he's posting all the updates live on twitter as we go along so so i reached out and asked him can you figure out about this debt and he has the same issue i make it about 167 billion so it's 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 a big discrepancy so I'm, I'm not quite sure what they're doing with this i mean th they've said that they're reducing their debt and that's that's one thing that i've always said look they're reducing this debt they're reducing this debt it looks like it has actually increased so i'm waiting for the 10k to see where this money has gone where they're actually reporting these figures and, and why my figures are so far out um so so that's my my biggest gripe I was expecting a dividend increase. They, they've kind of hinted that they will this year. So they've said that 
their free cash flow is expected to be 26 billion and our payout ratio will be high 50s it's it's low 50s at the minute so well, it'll be a one percent increase at some point this year it'll be a token increase to keep their aristocrat status but i wasn't overly impressed uh, net income was was much much lower this was obviously due to lower revenues but then they've also had impairment charges and stuff so it, it wasn't it wasn't great and it wasn't that bad but i was expecting a little bit better so i'm telling you we we spoke a few shows ago about reading the balance sheet and goodwill yeah. we were also one time talking about at and of about what was it 150 billion 160 billion goodwill on their balance sheet they uh, uh, I said wrote off 10% uh, of that now it's just a start and what happens now is that the assets will become worth less because of that they will need to sell it the debt will stay this means that their uh, credit ratings at a certain moment will come under pressure the reason why they are uh, doing so difficult about it either because they have a ceo cfo that doesn't understand how to write an annual report yeah because otherwise he would have understood that we are looking at as investors looking at such things so either he's not qualified for the job or they are misleading us on purpose it's simple like that for me everyone knows that uh, investors are looking at their debt profile and at the debt because that's the main worry about at t it yeah it's it's the biggest biggest concern uh, what are your thoughts david and dan i know you you have a position in t i think yeah i have a i have a minor position i i initiated uh late last year um kind of the uh i don't it's not i don't think it's this this this, this is going to grow a lot but the dividend is solid it's pretty good it's pretty high um they might not be growing it a lot that's okay i mean it's it's pretty as long as they keep paying at this level at my investment that's that's okay um and it's a kind of a a hope that if they can start being viewed as more of a streaming company than a than a telephone and a TV company, then that might mean that 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 the share price is going to increase. Um, I'm not in love with the stock or not or or the company, but it's a it's a it's a minor position, and I it's a it's a starter position. It's just a you know dip my my toes and and uh, let, let let's see where 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 it goes. And yeah, you can always. I don't think it's gonna. It's not going to tank, but it's not going to explode. So, if I get bored with it at some point, I might just sell it and move on. But I'm with you. You get just seven percent yield for that money. That's what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they they, they need to get rid of Direct TV. They, they just need to just cut their losses now at this stage, don't they? It's just like a a bad omen hanging over them. But anyway, we'll, we'll we'll move on. I think you looked at a European company this week, I think, have you? Yeah, I, I looked a bit in S, at SAP. I think Dividend Dane as well, so chip in uh, when you feel like. Uh, what I found really interesting in general about SAP, so what you need to know, what listeners need to know is that this company is struggling a little bit or catching up with the transformation into the cloud. They missed out initially on it um i think just because um they were so deep into the licensing model that it took them quite a while to to wake up that the world is changing around them they finally started changing it it's going really slow so if you if you look at the um, at the they're really still at the beginning in my opinion around their cloud transformation and um i said the impact is still minimal when it comes to the bottom line However, if they are able to, because what I did notice in their earnings is that they are outpacing, at least the cloud is a little bit more outpacing than the decline in, um, in, in, in the licenses. So what, what happens, what you also saw in Microsoft in the beginning, Azure was really little, right? But if you grow with a compounding annual growth rate of 30, 40% or more, at a certain moment it becomes meaningful. This is not yet the case at SAP and the growth rates are smaller there. However, um, I think if you look five, down, five years down the road, they might have done it because the main benefit for SAP is just that they have a lock-in in all those companies. It's so hard to get rid of SAP even, even if you did all your best. 
So I think the um, the earnings were a mixed bag from that point of view. Um, I said on a full year basis, their total revenue didn't really change. It dropped one percent. The cloud revenue grew seventeen percent. It's around eight billion now uh, on a yearly basis, whereas the software licenses business is around uh, fifteen billion, and it declined with a billion. So it, it is kind of therefore also uh, balancing out. But if you then look at um, uh, I said uh, uh, Q4. You could you could argue that it didn't went as good as they were probably um, hoping for uh, when it comes to deals that they made. So, I mean, it's it's for you soon to uh, chip in dividend day. But if I looked in at the share price at the moment, I think I f I feel uh, I still feel that it's on the high end and that it uh, should deserve to be a bit lower for the quality that they are delivering at the moment so make mix yeah. back totally agree my sentiment when i read it was me i mean it's just it's bland it's it's not bad but it's not good so it's just yeah um and and then i was, I was thinking is this a good entry point mm. yeah well i would like it to be a lot lower because I would I would have to SAP is like you said EG, EDGI it's a it's a good company and the companies that run SAP systems once they're in they ain't getting out you're gonna be in that microsystem forever but um, but there's not a lot of growth there yet because they like you said they they didn't get on board with with cloud and until late in the process so. If you wanted to buy a, a software company, I would I would find it a little hard to justify going into SAP compared to, say, uh, Microsoft or or something or something similar to that. I would I would you know what I mean SAP if you just look at it individually, yeah, it's a very investable company, but I I think there are better options out there currently. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I agree. It's 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 good that you mentioned Microsoft actually because they were one I think we should briefly touch on. I mean incredible I think is is yeah. the board we, they, they blew it out of the park let's be honest. Such a, I mean such a Nadella deserves a statue on Wall Street with what he has done with Microsoft they should just put him there between the bull and the bear. They should just put uh, such an Adela there. I mean, he, he's a master in what he did with this company, how he turned it around, and the profits. And like, I, I, we could just copy paste what we said after the Q3 earnings. Yeah, it's everything: LinkedIn, Xbox, Office, Azure. It's 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 uh, what is it? This this whole Power BI. It's everything. It's amazing. You know, it's it's really amazing. Yeah, they, they they don't seem to have a weak link in their in their armor. So I I kind of wish they they dropped under two hundred. I was I was hoping I was being greedy. I had a, had a purchase order, but I can't see that happening anytime soon. No. And uh, what do you think then about uh, Apple or 3M? Uh, 3M. I, I believe you have a video on YouTube about about it. You you've done a really nice video, so maybe you might be more best place to, to talk about how they went. So what is probably good for people to know is when you look now at the earnings, right? They were quite high in the cash flow as well. But what 3M has shown, so 80% of those bump in earnings was due to uh, cost control. Yeah, so cost cutting uh, um, and, and downscaling on the costs. That's why their earnings are so much up. Now you could say like, is this sustainable? Probably not. But it just shows how well managed the company is. Yeah, because if a company can can do this, it means it really knows where their costs are. It really knows how it can easily downscale it to 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 get well out of it. And just in general, um, you know, I, I always appreciate good management as such. And I just want to make a call out for what 3M has done when I went through the annual report and, and when it comes to the support of COVID. Yeah, with all the masks that they produced, all the all the uh, PPE for the nurses and and the first responders, for me it's just amazing what they did. The, the, this company um, we should reward later just because of all their efforts um, uh, in helping out fighting COVID. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. 
and and there's a common common team there isn't it between microsoft and, and 3m and it's it's management i've know you yeah. you've you've spoken about this before how management is important we we, we talked about ibm where the management is just lying Shy. idle yeah lying <laughs> idle and pardon your french and we we've got 3m and microsoft that that have have great management so it's um definitely something i'm i'm considering a little bit more um and i think a lot of investors would do well to to do that as well what about what about apple i, I don't have a position in apple I, I don't i don't ever plan on having one really um they're not on my radar so i, I haven't checked them out but yeah it's my top four position now actually apple mm -hmm. because i bought it at 130 dollars pre-split um well they, they i think they earned 112 billion in a single quarter so they were expecting 103 billion for the first time ever in a single quarter and they, they knocked it out of the park of 112 billion or 111 i don't know exactly uh, i think with with apple you don't even need to measure on a billion here or there anymore in a quarter because <laughs> it, 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 it is even like marginally not impacting anymore uh, but imagine how many phones these are and how many apps and how many subscriptions it's insane this company is insane uh, what they are earning and and, and the stock price didn't bump on it on the news, right? They all went a little bit so-so. So it, it, it shows also a little bit that I think we're at this moment where people start to wonder, okay, that so even 10% above expectations for both companies is not anymore increasing the share price. That mean that mean that signals something. So well, yeah, maybe it's already priced in. People people expected it and it's it's priced into the market already, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, we're just at the top somewhere with this. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So we might move on then to our listeners' questions. We've got we've got a few here. And we'll start with Dividend Wave. Yes, today. What is the most amusing or surprising moment of all this week? Yeah, so for me, it was really um, uh, when I saw the earnings coming in from 3M. When I read the report, I, I was really excited. I was really excited. I didn't expect it. David and Dane? Yeah, I, 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 I can't re remember where I saw it, but it was this small company that got caught up in all this uh, GameStop uh, show or whatever you want to call it. Uh, a small oil company somewhere uh, with five employees selling 70 barrels of oil a day and a stock that, that this, you know, never gets traded. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> the, the company rose like a thousand percent in the blink of an eye and <laughs> everyone was just, what's going on here? I found that quite interesting. If, if you're one of those employees and you have shares in that company, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> Damn right. Cool. Um, so the next question then is from Phil, and he asked us, "What is the most exotic stock you've ever had?" So I had to look it up, but I couldn't find it anymore. But ten years ago, I remember I had a penny stock, which was a Russian uh, plane manufacturer. <laughs> and it was not Topolev, but I remember buying it for I don't know one euro twenty, and then it went down to one euro one day, one forty the other day. I think I sold it at I don't know forty cents. So that's where my hundred euro uh, went because that was my kind of investment investment strategy at the time. I felt like yeah, well, who doesn't like Russian airlines? It sounds cheap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How about you, David and Dean? Um, I was caught up in all that a couple of years ago, I think it was in 17, all, uh, everything that was related to cannabis in Canada was just the hot ticket. And, um, I've always been kind of the type, I don't want to buy the same thing everyone else has. So, <laughs> so I, I was looking through all this list of cannabis related companies in Canada and I found some small grower somewhere and i thought yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna go for that so i bought some it's probably just a farmer with a field somewhere in a greenhouse and yeah it didn't really go well because i didn't i didn't sell in time it was up quite a lot at some point then it just fell you know in a in a couple of days it, it went from 15 dollars to to like three and it was like what's yeah so 
not a big kid. <laughs> yeah, m- mine is in a similar area in, in cannabis. I, I bought Canopy Growth, and I remember when I bought it, it shot up like twenty percent straight away. And there was talks of cannabis being the new, the new trend. I was like, I, I'm on it here. I'm, go- I'm going, to, I'm going to hit the jackpot. And I, I found out pretty fast that <laughs> I did not hit the jackpot. It, it, it tanked just as quickly as as it went up. So that's about as exotic as I got. It wasn't the new GameStop. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Hey, I wish I got into Kodak and, and GameStop at, at, at the right times. So I, I don't have these powers to foresee the future. So we have Dividend Doc, um, and he's asked a question for, for you, uh, Dividend Dane, and he wants to know, where can one learn more about how to evaluate a REIT? Well, there is a... Uh, uh... There is a, a, like a, an organization uh, of REITs in, in the U.S. called NA REIT. Uh, it's, uh, they have a website called REIT.com. They, 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 there's a lot of educational stuff there, and there's also a lot of um, like industry sources and news. And um, There are some, some other sources. Um, I know that... If you if you're a beginner and you, you want to learn the basics of, of just how to, to look through a, a, you know a financial report uh, investopedia has a couple of uh, decent articles on there um, that also explains uh, some of the terms because you know normal metrics like EPS and PE values and stuff like that is completely useless so um, go on there. Um, there are some pretty good writers on Seeking Alpha that I, I could recommend. Um, uh, like Hoya Capital in Colorado Wealth Management do a lot of research on, on REITs. Are pretty good follows. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've seen some on, on some of the brokers, like the Goyro and Interactive Brokers have, have educational yeah articles on them it's a good place to start because they give you the fundamentals that that you need to know as well so um yeah good we have a question then from uh richland and i i believe you answered this already on on twitter but he, he asked us to, do you guys have any experiences with etfs um he's, he's kind of at a loss as to why so many stocks as well are shown red even when when they when they beat earnings um my take on ETFs is uh, we've, we've spoke about it in, in Ireland. We have ridiculous rules such as deemed disposal where we have to pretend to sell every eight years. Drives me absolutely nuts. So I stay away from ETFs. Um, and in terms of stocks looking red on earnings, earnings are short term. I, I mean, I never buy and sell based on a quarterly earnings. It's more the sentiment of what's happening into the future. And I think that's that's what they are in. If you're seeing a stock, they, they might have beat estimates. And I, I, I've pointed out earlier, estimates can be set so low that they can do nothing but beat them. But it, it's really, are they showing progression or, or future growth or, or, or so on? And I, I think you mentioned something similar to that as well, David and Dane. Yeah. And just with, with regards to the ETFs, I mean, it depends a lot, like you said, with the taxation. Some of the Some countries have some rather peculiar laws regarding uh, the taxation of ETFs and but in general I like having a small portion of, of ETF um, because of the diversification that it that it gives me because I don't buy Apple or Facebook yeah. something like that. so I can get it through an ETF and still some broad market market exposure. Yeah, look, I recommend just checking out our episode on ETFs and, and you'll hear myself and EDGI's um, opinions on, on them. So our friend Dapper Dividends has, has a question for us. And he asked us, is there a more important metric than free cash flow to determine the health of a company and potentially give early warning signs of trouble ahead? the amount of footnotes in the annual report i i can't remember who who said this but there was a quote that if you read the footnotes of an annual report you're ahead of the majority of investors because i can't imagine too many people 
people read them yeah i read them sometimes and it's uh, insane what they write in there and um but and they need to yeah so all the bad news is in the footnotes all the good news news is in the ceo message so for me uh reading the footnotes and also reading the risk part of the annual report just the top three even if they write 20 just the top three you get a good feeling of where the risks are for the company and what they're struggling with so the top two three after COVID, because COVID is is obviously the number one risk for everyone at the minute so skip skip COVID. Uh, you might be surprised how often they put uh, actually what i see the most is the uh, low rent the low interest environment they usually put at number one so that's usually the first one that i see and then they say like so if rates go up it might have a material damage to their whole uh, earnings so this just tells me why we are in this uh, in this situation that the fed keeps buying stuff and printing stuff because they know once they start changing their policy they will put all these companies in trouble yeah but in terms of a metric and just pure numbers for me cash flow free cash flows is the most important uh yes but i also look at uh for instance debt debt ratios so the financial health not necessarily because you have the the current ratio you have the interest coverage ratio and you have the debt to equity uh, uh, yeah. one. and one of those three i also find always really important pretty good okay and we have a question that goes to you european dj from pedro and he asked do you ever feel overwhelmed about the stocks sometimes he feels like just selling everything and, and going for an etf strategy um like in a week like this yes yeah when when i can't keep up with all the earnings and i also need to be a father and a, and a husband at home it's tough um you know i've got boring etfs in a retirement plan and that's more than enough i just like stock picking it's my passion like there, there are a few things that i like it's football and stock picking so i mean okay let's look at the boring etf what what do i do then the, the in the week i don't check share prices anyway really so I mean, what, you, what should i do? be home be be sad and you could become a better footballer and play more football um the only way is down at this age so <laughs> uh, for me look i always recommend recommend to my friends and such buy an index fund or an etf don't even bother doing stock picking if you don't want to spend the time on it yeah. yeah because once you start stock picking you need to you you need to commit yourself to reading annual reports being able to say in one two sentences why you like a company otherwise just buy an in index and don't don't otherwise just gambling so yeah and maybe your portfolio size is a little bit too big if you're overwhelmed like you don't have to look at every single stock like there's there's plenty of stocks that i don't know about or i i don't care to look at i mm -hmm. prefer to to look at my portfolio first and then if there's like like apple for instance i know they are a good company but i'm not going to read their their earnings or annual report i, I don't own them there's there's plenty of people out there to tell me what happens so stick stick to what's in your portfolio and yeah ignore and then, the rest really and then even just your top five or top ten because usually your your let's say top five or top ten define already half the portfolio for most investors uh, even if you have 30 other stocks so just those five to ten is already enough because the other other 20 30 might not have a meaningful impact anyway and and over time you'll be so used to your portfolio you, you know all those companies inside out so it becomes less tedious and a little bit easier to manage yeah i kind so, of think yep no go on i kind of think that if you do your homework once you invest you don't necessarily have to look at all quarterly reports Not if you're all. a long-term investor like and you invest for, for for dividends and dividend growth i mean if you do your homework and you decide that app b is a good company that you want to invest in you don't need to read every single report in detail unless the stock tanks 30 percent you might get the sense of something is wrong but if it just goes along nice and easy then everything is the way it should be i kind of think if you look through one of your stocks once a year that's that that should that's be enough. yeah yeah 
And usually you know what you're looking for because you have you had a hypothesis telling you why you bought it. So for instance, for T, the first thing I do is, is I, I, I literally do control F balance sheet. I look at the debt, what happened to it. That's it. And then I Google, uh, sorry, I do control F free cash flow. Ah, seems seems normal, same as last time. Good, next. Yeah. Yeah, very good, very good points. You you don't really need to get caught up in in quarterly reports. And and it goes back to to Rickland's question about stocks looking red after after earnings. I mean, earnings is it's it's a short term short term view. You the annual report is really all you need to be reading. You, you don't need the rest of you, you can glance over them and, and get the sentiment like like Intel when it dropped nine, ten percent. Then read it. What happened? But I mean you don't need to go into details all the time so it might be maybe why they're asking it uh, as well and they need to just send this to, on twitter but what i often hear is that beginning investors feel afraid for the amount of money that they are putting in the stock market in general yeah and then reading every report doesn't give you more feeling of control i can tell you that so if you're generally concerned about the money you have in the stock market then it's better to consider about that right uh, why does it concern you if you have that you have so much money in the stock market is your risk tolerance not right uh, for this uh, yeah and and uh, of course uh, yeah of course stocks might not just be fueled and etfs are just a, a better strategy if if you want to set and forget etfs are, are definitely 100 percent a better a better strategy okay and the last question then is from dividend in check and he asked us what do you think of adc as an alternative to realty income yeah so um agree realty um, is uh, similar to realty income in the sense that they have the they are both what is known as a triple net lease read um what that means is that uh the company owns the building but the the building the tax um for the the building uh, what what's it called uh, like the land tax the uh, insurance of the of the, on the building and the upkeep of the building is passed on and is the responsibility of the entity that that rents the the structure if you will uh, so so they're they're the same. Um, Agree Realty is primarily um, retail. Um, they have a lot of uh, Walgreens, as, uh, as you probably know. Uh, they have a lot of Home Depot. They have a lot of uh, they, they, their portfolio is quite good, and they are doing some. You can buy a lot of the stores has this that. Uh, are, are designed that you can buy online and then you can pick it up at the store. It's a, a thing that they have been rolling out aggressively um, with their uh, the renters. Um, it's uh, it's dipped, I believe. It, it's not a star I follow that closely, but it was expensive at some point. I believe the the price has come down slightly, um, and um, yeah, it's I would it's very. Uh, it's an appealing company and it, they, they are doing quite well they um, they don't pay out monthly so if like like uh, like realty income so well then it's not an alternative then <laughs> <laughs> no no I, I i didn't know much about them i had a little read of them just before we went online and i think they've in, they've paid or increased for 107 quarters now as well so they are quite a solid dividend growing company as well so from my 10 minutes of looking over them before the show they they, they look okay um and maybe a, a good good company to have as, as part of your portfolio with with realty income okay so i think that brings us to the end of the show um dividend end it's, it's been a pleasure it's been great speaking to you and, and and meeting you um you have a lot of knowledge on on reits and it was interesting to hear your perspective on them edj is as always it's been a pleasure we, we didn't get a rant this week but maybe we'll talk about ibm <laughs> a little bit more next week 
Um, and, and again, to, to all our listeners, if you listen this far, thanks a million. Um, we would appreciate if you left some reviews on our podcast. It really help us to grow. We've noticed that we've started to get a couple and it's it's helping us. So we would really appreciate if you could maybe leave her a, a review. Um, but thanks again for listening and we shall see you all next week. Thanks for having me on, guys.